This is a, a continuation of uh, Tracy's talk. Uh, however, we focused on the, uh, uh, the larger particulate organic matter uh, being uh, leaf litter breakdown. Um, currently, there are two major threats to Hawaiian watersheds. The first uh, includes urbanization, uh, as depicted in the satellite image of Hilo Bay. You can see uh, all the, quite a bit of development there around the bay uh, by the airport. Uh, as Tracy mentioned too, Hilo is one of the largest cities in the United States that still uses cesspools. Something on the order of 40% uh, of the homes uh, are connected to the sewer system. The remainder, remaining 60%, uh, still use cesspools or septic tanks. And uh, this is a nice picture of a cesspool being installed. You can see the PVC pipe or the sewage flows out into simply a hole lined by cinder blocks. Um, and then the sewage can seep out into the adjacent ground. Now, if there's bedrock there that has cracks, that sewage can easily seep into groundwater or uh, nearby streams or uh, coastal areas. The second threat uh, are invasive species, uh, particularly Albizia or Falcoteria molucana. And Flint Hughes gave an excellent uh, summary of Albizia yesterday. Um, this is an image showing uh, Falcoteria or Albizia forest invading a native uh, Ohia forest. Uh, Albizia, it's native to the Moluccas, New Guinea, and the Solomon Islands. Uh, it was first introduced in Hawaii in 1917 and then was extensively planted uh, throughout the 20s uh, and 50s uh, to reforest degraded watersheds. Uh, it's a very fast growing, very large tree, can often uh, reach heights above 100 feet. Um, and it's also a nitrogen fixer produces large amounts of leaf litter on the order of two, almost two to 10 times that of native Ohia. And uh, this Albizia leaf litter is high in nitrogen content as it's a, a nitrogen fixing tree. And it's successfully invaded native forests and riparian areas in Hawaii, as well as other islands in the Western Pacific region. And uh, Flint Hughes and Julie Denslow uh, have shown that it can have large scale ecosystem impacts. And, I stole this uh, figure from Flint, uh, one of his papers, where he and Amanda showed that uh, leaf litter breakdown actually increases in Albizia invaded forests. So the bottom line, the dashed line, uh, is leaf litter in the invaded forest. The top solid lines are in native forest. So quite a bit difference there. And the other thing that jumped out at me is that the, the white symbols there, Albizia, in the, in the uh, native forest up top, uh, it seemed to break down faster than Ohia, and I was, when I saw that, I was curious if you would see similar patterns in Hawaiian streams. Now, uh, Flint and a, and a larger group also uh, demonstrated that Albizia could potentially lead to elevated nitrogen concentrations in stream water. So they sampled uh, four streams, uh, sampled water above Albizia stands and below Albizia stands, and you can see here, uh, particularly in the Ainuco stream, uh, there's uh, a higher uh, concentrations of dissolved inorganic nitrogen uh, below Albizia stands. So with that introduction then, um, the objectives for our project uh, were simply one, to examine how urbanization might impact leaf litter breakdown in Hawaiian streams. Um, leaf litter breakdown has been shown to be a good proxy for water quality, and where you have urbanization, you tend to have increased nutrient loading into, into streams. That increased nutrient loads can then increase uh, leaf litter breakdown in streams. And we're curious if we would see uh, this, uh, if we would be able to detect differences between urbanized and forested reaches of streams. If you saw Tracy's talk, you're probably going to uh, can guess the conclusion of that. Um, the second uh, objective was to determine if inputs of leaves from an invasive end fixing tree would impact leaf litter breakdown in streams and thus nutrient dynamics. So would we see similar patterns that Flint was seeing in these forested uh, areas? And this has uh, 
uh, interesting implications for water quality uh, if, if we do detect those differences. And then the third objective was to determine if inputs of leaves from an invasive end fixing tree might impact the stream food web by providing tastier leaf litter uh, that's high in nitrogen. And if I could sort of expand on this for a minute. Uh, in continental streams, uh, we tend to find organisms that we refer to as shredders. And I'm not uh, talking about someone who's ripping it up out at Honolii or Diamond Head. Um, these are aquatic insect larvae that live in the streams and they feed on leaf litter. They shred it up into smaller particles and dissolve nutrients. Now, many, as many of you probably know, we lack these organisms in Hawaiian streams. However, there are some potential shredders that we have that include Macrobrachium lar and as well as the, the crayfish Procambus clarki. Now, to date, there have been uh, three studies that I know have that, have that have looked at leaf litter breakdown in Hawaiian streams, and they all concluded that invertebrates in Hawaiian streams play a minimal, if at all, any of a role in leaf litter breakdown. L leaf litter breakdown is largely due to fungal and microbial colonization. Now, these studies used native leaf litter, and so I was curious if you introduced uh, a leaf litter that's high in nitrogen, and thus it, it's a higher food quality, because it tends to be colonized by microbes and fungus, which then condition the leaf litter, making it more palatable, more uh, tasty, if you will, uh, to the invertebrates. How would this affect the food web structure in our Hawaiian streams? So that being said, uh, we set out and uh, to conduct our experiment, we collected uh, senescent leaf litter from invasive albizia stands, and throughout the remainder of the talk, the red color will indicate uh, uh, albizia and thus the uh, evilness of its, uh, this invasive tree. And the blue color uh, will indicate native ohia. So we sampled, we collected senescent leaf litter from both uh, uh, tree types, and there's Carrie showing uh, our, our uh, collection of the day, so uh, collecting our leaf litter. We brought the leaves back to the labs, and then we constructed two types of uh, leaf litter packs open litter and closed litter. And the reason why we did this is to get at uh, wh whether or not invertebrates are feeding on leaf litter. So the, the closed leaf litter bags, the one millimeter mesh, will sort of exclude any larger invertebrates, the shrimp or the, the prawn or the crayfish. The open litter packs would allow them to access the leaf litter and feed on it if that's what they're doing. Now, open litter packs are typically made out of large mesh, like one centimeter um, bird exclusion mesh you can get at the hardware store, or um, citrus bags or pecan bags. And if any of you have seen Albizia leaf litter, litter, it's about the size of a piece of oatmeal. So it's very small and it can fall out of these, uh, the typical leaf litter bags. So we had, to, we had several failed attempts to construct open litter packs. And finally, seeing it as we are in Hawaii, we sort of embraced the sense of aloha and uh, we made Albizia lays. And when I say we, I of course mean Fran and Carrie, uh, who strung up thousands of, of this Albizia leaf litter and produced many Albizia lays as well as some Ohia lays. So those represented our open packs that would allow the larger organisms uh, to feed on it. So once we had our open and our closed packs, then we deployed them in the Wailuku. We constructed uh, these tubes out of hardware cloth, metal hardware cloth that was coated with uh, sort of a plastic coating. And then we attached, an upper, in the upper right hand corner you can see there's a closed pack and then the, the open lay right next to it. We attached those on the inside. And then attached those, those tubes to chains which were then deployed in the river. Um, the tubes were arranged so that they were perpendicular to the flow. And then that open end would allow any organisms to come in there if they wanted to. And then we deployed these um, at two sites. Uh, the first site is the upper forested site on the Wailuku River. Uh, it's in Pihihonua, and it's at an elevation of about 500 meters. Uh, the riparian forest there is dominated by native forest, including koa, ohia, and hapu'u. And we deployed them in a lower uh, urbanized site, which again, urbanized is relative compared to some of the urbanized sites in, uh, on Oahu or in the uh, continent. Uh, there was urbanization and ag lots adjacent to this reach of the stream, and riparian trees were dominated by exotics, including albizia and rose apple. And this just arrow shows where we deployed. That's the Wailuku River, and that was our lower site near the mouth, and you can see, again, development uh, nearby that, that reach of the stream. So once we deployed them, we returned to these sites once a week for five weeks, and we collected triplicate leaf packs of ohia and albizia, from the upper and lower sites, brought them back to the lab, sorted them for any invertebrates that may have colonized the leaf litter, and then we subsampled the leaves for fungal and bacterial analysis. Uh, the remaining leaf material was then dried, and we used that to calculate a decomposition rate. 
And this is a picture of Franny uh, extracting her gosterol to estimate fungal biomass. She gave an excellent poster the other day. Um, her gosterol is a compound that's specific to the cell walls of fungal organisms on, on uh, leaf litter. And you can use it to estimate fungal biomass. Now, if you remember, those three leaf litter studies uh, that have been conducted previously suggested that, that fungal organisms were the main component of leaf litter decomposition. And it's, they never actually measured it. They just suggested it. So this is the first time that this has been measured, uh, to my knowledge, in the Pacific, and maybe the second or third time that's been measured in the tropics. Okay, so what did we find? This is sort of typical results of what we were seeing. The y-axis is the percent ash-free dry mass remaining. The x-axis is the days the leaf packs were in the stream. Again, red is albizia and blue is ohia. And you can see that the, uh, the red circles had lower uh, ash-free dry mass remaining over time. So this uh, reveals that albizia is breaking down faster than ohia, which is similar to what Flint was seeing uh, in his forested sites. Now you can take the slope of these lines and you can calculate a decay coefficient or a K. And then you can use that K to actually do statistics and compare decomposition between sites, between leaf types, et cetera. And that's, the, that's indicated here in this next graph. This is kind of a lot of data here and I'll sort of walk us through the graph. The y-axis is your decay coefficient or your K value. Uh, X-axis is forested versus urbanized sites. Um, Again, red is albizia, blue is ohia. The open bars represent the closed bags, and the hatched bars represent um, the open bags. Now, the decay coefficient, the higher the K value, the greater the, the breakdown rate, or the faster it's decomposing. And you, it's most evident in the forested site in the fall of 2006, and you can see that the albizia has a higher K value than the blue ohia, so it's breaking down much faster. Now, if we take these K values and we plug it into a repeated measures uh, factorial ANOVA, we see that uh, Albizia uh, is breaking down significantly faster than OHIA, as indicated by the red color. However, we didn't see differences between bag types, so no difference between open and closed bags, suggesting that, like uh, previous studies, invertebrates are not playing a large role in decomposition, despite the fact they have these tastier, uh, nitrogen-rich leaves. And like Tracy, we didn't detect any differences in sight, so similar values reported from forested and urbanized areas, which is largely due to the fact that urbanized is relative, and there were similar nutrient concentrations between those two sites. Uh, we did see uh, seasonal differences uh, in the fall. We uh, had significantly higher breakdown rates, which I think is attributed to um, uh, lower flow. Um, and I would just like to point out that these values are similar to the uh, breakdown values are similar to those reported uh, in Honolii and other streams in Hawaii, but it tends to be at sort of the lower end of values reported from other uh, studies in the temperate and tropical streams. So we are having lower breakdown rates here. So Albizia is breaking down faster than Ohia, and we attributed this to greater fungal biomass colonization. So we've got fungal biomass on the y-axis, milligrams per gram of leaf, and then x-axis is days and stream. And you can see uh, for this time point, this is again uh, representative of our other time points, we had more uh, fungal biomass on Albizia than Ohia. And it's sort of, there's a jump start. So the, the fungal biomass was um, able to colonize Albizia more readily, and, and, but by the end of the experiment, you can see Ohia had caught up to Albizia. I don't think that matters, though, because I think uh, it, that was enough of a jump start to give Albizia this sort of increased decompositional rate. And I see many of you are saying, well, that's really interesting, but wow, your fungal biomass is really low compared to the, some of the studies that we're familiar with. And you're right. So by day 30, people are usually reporting 20 to 80 milligrams of fungal biomass. So we're at the very, very low end of the spectrum there. And I'll come back to that here again in a minute. Okay, so what does this mean in terms of streams in Hawaii? Well, if you look at the remaining nitrogen that's in the leaf litter, so you take uh, the y-axis, you plot how much nitrogen is left in the leaf litter versus how much uh, ash-free dry mass is remaining, you can see that for Ohia, what happens is as you go uh, to the right of the x-axis, we're actually decomposing or decaying. We're actually increasing nitrogen on the leaf litter, even though it's decomposing. This is what we sort of typically see, because what's happening is, is as the leaf litter is decomposing, it's being colonized by fungal and microbial organisms, and they're increasing the nitrogen content by sequestering nitrogen out of the water column. And you can see the slope is significant. My R squared is crappy, but there's a pattern there. Um, if we look at Albizia, we see the opposite pattern. Um, as we, as we lose mass, we lose nitrogen. So Albizia is a source of nitrogen to these streams as it's decomposing, despite the fact that it has more fungal biomass than Ohia. It's still a, a larger source of nitrogen to streams. Okay, 
Well, that's cool and everything, but what does it mean? All right. If you recall, leaf litter breakdown and fungal biomass were both lower than uh, in, in values reported elsewhere. Well, why would that be? There's two reasons. The first, we're lacking a lot of the invertebrates, the organisms in our streams that would process the leaf litter. The second is that our streams are actually pretty in, in pretty good shape. Phosphorus tends to be at or below detection limits, and nitrogen is also very low. So based on that information, um, I went back to the Inaco stream where they uh, that we're measuring these elevated levels of nitrogen, and I went out there with Becky Ostertag in one of her classes, and we deployed leaf litter bags out there and then in a, a, a cleaner reach uh, that had lower nutrient levels. And we found that for both Albizia and Ohia, we got greater decomposition in, the, in this urbanized reach compared to the forested reach. Uh, specifically, you can see Albizia again is breaking down faster than Ohia. And this is just after two weeks. So uh, clearly, we need to, it would be interesting to revisit this and redeploy this for a whole 30-day period and then also get at the fungal biomass and see if, if that is affecting um, the colonization. So if you take all of these graphs that I just threw up here and, and I, I, I threw together a conceptual model because no talk is complete without one, and instead of a black box, we have a blue box because we're in streams. And you have your albizia leaves in your blue box which are breaking down and they're just doing their process. And then you throw in human activity development in watersheds, your cow factor, if you may, um, and you increase uh, stream nutrient levels. If you increase stream nutrient levels, you're going to increase decomposition, uh, breakdown rates of albizia leaves, which will then increase the amount of nutrients that are released to the stream, and we can get a positive feedback loop where we're going to just uh, continually increase decomposition, um, increase the nutrient loads, and decrease the water quality of our streams, because the nutrients then will drive microbial activity, eutrophication, uh, affecting the, the coastal and, and the streams in Hawaii. So those are my conclusions. Thank you.